I had this neighbor that was maybe 10 years older than me. And one day I, I went over and he had similar desk to this covered like in electronic parts. He was making a pretty much a surround system, like amplifier and speakers and stuff like that. I was very curious. So I kept like asking more and more questions. And he was like, oh, you seem like pretty interested in this. I have a really good intro book to electronics. Why don't you take it with you? And if he doesn't have to answer all these questions, I can just find the answers myself. I stayed up multiple nights in a row to finish that book. And it was just so exciting to me to like be able to look at a device and understand somewhat what's going on. Welcome back to the Fresh Engineer podcast, where fresh engineers share their stories. I'm your host and mechanical engineer Anna Reich, and in today's episode, I'm talking to Boris Nimcevic, who's an embedded engineer and hardware engineer from Serbia, who has studied and worked in the United States before coming to Sweden, where he now works as an embedded engineer at the startup Quantify, while also building his own maker business, LiloDoc. We actually used to live in the same dorm while studying at KTH here in Stockholm, and I'm so glad he agreed to be on this podcast. In our conversation, we talk about why he quit his business studies and started from scratch to study engineering his experience designing electronic systems for children's toys at an American toy company, how he found his first client as a freelance engineering consultant, and how you can get started working with electronics and teaching yourself the basics even without going to engineering school. So let's dive right in. Going all the way to the beginning, what were you like as a kid? Where did you grow up? What were you interested in? Yeah, so I grew up in this um, relatively small town on the north part of Serbia. Actually, the northeast town only. 10 kilometers away from Hungary, called Subotica. And I was I was pretty quiet, I think, as a kid and, and pretty shy. My interest, yeah, I guess sports were a really big thing. And also uh, my dad being a pretty good athlete throughout his youth, I think that was valued the most. So yeah, most of the time I actually spent either practicing some sport with like sports team or just improvising some sports on the streets. So And then maybe going to your high school days, what were your favorite subjects? And do you think that had any impact on your career aspirations? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, here it's important to explain that uh, at least high schools in Serbia, you you already start kind of picking your major pretty much. In in my hometown, there were several high schools, which each high school would have its own uh, focus. So I went to a high school that, uh, well, you were being educated to become like uh, electrical uh, technician or com computer technician or mechanical technician even. So you're not engineer, you're a technician after that. And, mm -hmm. and it helps you, of course, uh, after that continue like university for engineering or, mm. or anything like that. And it's kind of double-edged sword because like you, the scary part is that at the age of 14, 15, whenever you're starting high school, you have to choose uh, your focus. Yeah. And, and I know a lot of people many years later still struggle to know what what they want to do so it's a little bit of hit or miss when you're at that age uh there is one option to uh, one high school that is kind of like a general education uh, we call it gymnasium but that one is the most competitive and of course it has limited number of, of seats so mm -hmm. for me actually it worked out quite nicely i i knew i wanted to go into something electrical something that has to do with electronics which which was the high school that i that i went to so when you asked what were my favorite subjects it, it was specific to that major so my my favorite subjects at during high school were, were anything about electronics pretty much any what you would call university ee courses like electrical engineering courses of course uh on the lower level than university okay so what kind of things do you learn already that maybe, uh, I don't know, other people didn't learn. Uh, yeah, I mean, so my, my again, I, I feel weird calling it major, but it's kind of like a focus. But, yeah. but let's, let's call it major just for uh, simplicity. So my major was a computer technician. So, and, and, and the idea is that uh, once you finish the four-year program of that high school, you could um, troubleshoot computers, uh, like work maybe in the IT department of, uh, of a company that is not heavily on tech or so like some some basic things which cover both uh, har hardware in terms of electronics and software so the typical courses would be you start with like some basics of like electrical engineering like actually studying some physics some math to, to support that but eventually leading to some also computer science classes uh, where you maybe explore different operating systems like 
I mean, at, in Serbia, everybody using Windows at the time, but then I was introduced to Linux. And yeah, again, so nothing too crazy, but if you imagine the university, but on a junior level. So when you graduated from that school, what were the different career options that you considered? So what what helps you, this focusing uh, early on, it, it does help you get into uh, universities that kind of extend that, that track. So uh, if I was going to go to study electrical engineering, for example, I would have easier time passing the entrance exams because I already studied that. Mm-hmm. As opposed to people who who were not who were not studying the same subjects in in the high school but wanted to go to that track. But as a disclaimer, I am talking about the uh, Serbian educational system. I'm I'm not sure until the university how uh, other countries work. I mean, I I heard stories, but I, I of course I didn't go through. Mm. But ironically, <laughs> by by the time I finished uh, high school, I was a little bit uh, not sick of engineering <laughs> but i i was uh i was a little bit discouraged and and i i now in a, as an uh, adult I, I understand what was going on and it's usually as an engineer you you're solving problems mm. and and looking at, at a problem as like a negative thing so so you're struggling to solve something and as soon as you solve it then you're given another problem and so most of the time you spend in this not not so pleasant state right you you are you are challenged and by the time I finished high school, I, I was a little bit discouraged because I didn't like this, that I would spend so much effort into something and then it wouldn't work at the end. And at the same time, I, I also met some people who were entrepreneurs. Yeah, I know it's a really uh, broad term, but they, they were successful entrepreneurs, right? Mm-hmm. And I started reading some of the books on business and I thought maybe that's what I want to do. And then I actually, um, I started my bachelor was studying ba- uh, business management. So nothing to do with what I was doing my whole life up on, until then. And you studied but, in the US, right? Uh, yeah, so when I was finishing high school, I kind of didn't see myself uh, on, on those like f- a few paths that were offered uh, in my home country. And I was very curious about the world uh, outside Serbia. I didn't have that much uh, opportunity to travel pretty much until I finished uh, high school. And I'm talking about being almost 19. Mm. So yeah, I, I was just very curious to go somewhere and have a different experience. Uh, and I knew some people that were studying in the uh, United States from my hometown. So yeah, I managed to get a uh, scholarship through sports that I was doing at the time. Uh, what sports was that? Oh, so it was track and field, which is like uh, in American English, it's called athletics in most of Europe. Mm. So I was a sprinter pretty much. Mm. So I managed to get a scholarship for, for that uh, in a small university in West Virginia. And, and yeah, and before I knew it, I, w- I was having uh, accounting classes and marketing. And <laughs> maybe like three months before that, I was doing my, uh, it's not like thesis, but uh, graduation work on, on making some power supplies or something like that. So it was, it was like quite a turn. Mm-hmm. And how was that? Was that the way you expected it? Or did you like studying business? Yes, I... I mean, in, in general, I think I'm quite curious. So any topic I like to dive deep into. Mm. Um, but I do have to say that I, I was still, because I was part of the sports team, I, I was focusing more on sports than my studies. Uh, like that was that was where I really wanted to succeed. Later on, I would realize <laughs> if it, no, that's not the best uh, strategy. But uh, but at that time, when I, yeah, when I was studying business, it was I, I was spending more time in like weight room and running <laughs> that I was spending in library. But. Okay. <laughs> um, but then you still decided to study engineering after that, right? You still need- yeah. So I think as I was slowly well, maturing through my first bachelor, I, I realized that I was missing, uh, missing building something. And, and even so I would, I was studying business courses. I mean, I was going through business courses on in my free time. I would like watch YouTube or or read upon like electronics. And and I actually in my third year of going through business school, I I bought equipment to make electronics in my dorm room. Like I bought soldering iron and yeah some other basic tools. And then, then I realized actually that's <laughs> that's what I wanted to do this whole time. I was just too scared of it because I was maybe discouraged by some some failures in high or I, I wouldn't even call those failures it was just like like i said that the challenge that sometimes doesn't result in something that works and then you get this 
yeah, not so nice feeling, I guess. Mm. Yeah, I can relate to that. So were there any engineers in your family or any acquaintances that were in engineering already that maybe also encouraged you to go into that? Uh, no, so both of my parents are technical, but uh, both of them are more on a technician level. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, until I was in engineering uh, university, uh, spoilers, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I... I, I never met a, a, a real engineer, like a, a real a person who had engineering degree and was actually doing in engineering. Yeah. And now looking back, it's kind of not, not bad. looking back, it's kind of crazy. But I was what, what what was like motivating me to to go back into engineering? It was just that experience of building something and like having hands on mm. experience, I guess. Okay. And so then, how did you decide what kind of engineering to study? <laughs> yeah. So maybe I'm jumping around. The, timeline but well after business school I, I or during the business school I, I just realized I wanted to go back to doing kind of tinkering with electronics mm. but how I decided I wanted to to do electronics was pretty much just a, a very big coincidence and and that, that's going back to me deciding which high school to go to and mm -hmm. um, there was I, ha I had this neighbor that was maybe uh, 10 years older than me and um we, but we were both in the video game, so some, so sometimes I would go over his house uh, just to hang out. And one day I, I went over, and he had uh, like similar desk to this, like covered like in electronic parts. And mm -hmm. and I was very curious, like uh, like what is all this mess? Like what, what are you doing? Like I never seen this before. And then he explained me like he was making um, a pretty much a surround system, like a, a, a amplifier and and speakers and stuff like that. So I kept like asking more and more questions and he was like, oh, you seem like pretty interested in this. Like, um, I have a really good like intro book to electronics. Why don't you take it with you? And so maybe he doesn't have to answer all these questions. I can just find the answers myself. I stayed up multiple nights in a row to finish that book. And I, I find this so ridiculous because like kids at that age or like my friends had the same experience with maybe Harry Potter or some fiction. And I... I wasn't interested in that. I remember like reading the book and you start start uh, first like learning about resistor and, and I was like, oh, I got to learn what this component does. And then the next page is like a uh, capacitor or whatnot. Um, and I, I, I just was slowly like realizing or like learning about the, the, the world around me, all of those green boards, like what each component is. And it was just so exciting to me to like be able to look at a device and understand somewhat what's going on mm. uh, and so i think the, the book was like really big and i finished it maybe within a week and then after that i i asked my parents if they can buy me a soldering iron and stuff like that so i started building stuff from the book because the book was uh it was actually like a practical guide to electronics so it had a lot of projects that you can mm. you had like a shopping list already so it was pretty beginner friendly and that made me go into that field i guess so again the decision maybe happened around when i was 14 15 but later on it's just like going back to the first love i guess yeah okay and then you studied computer engineering right yeah so i i don't regret it but a lot of people thought it was uh, pretty crazy including my parents i had two more courses to finish to get a degree of uh, business management um uh, but I realized that's not <laughs> not what I want to do. I really want to go back to my like engineering path. So I, I switched uh, universities after my third year and pretty much started from scratch. I got into New York University, which was, yeah, it, it was a, really a, a dream coming true. And I, I first enrolled in electrical engineering, a major electrical engineering. And throughout my first year, I realized what I really like is kind of the work that will go into consumer electronics. So kind of low power, but something that also runs the some, some kind of software. And then I learned that's not electrical engineering major, that's computer engineering major so i i switched but they have so much overlap maybe 80 percent. so i mm -hmm. i just switched on paper technically though the difference came in the, maybe the last year of university so could you explain a little bit more what computer engineering is yeah so there is electrical engineering on one end of the spectrum i guess if i can call it like that and computer science on the other one and mm -hmm. And then computer engineering would kind of be the mix of the two. What it really means in practice is working on computer hardware, which re uh, requires some knowledge of hardware itself, of course, but also some uh, software knowledge because you uh, most of the time you actually write software instead of 
do anything with hardware. And it, it was nice uh, studying that because I got the bigger pool of courses that I can take. So I can kind of pick and choose from, oh, I want this electrical engineering courses and this computer science courses. And it, it was actually quite flexible. Was that experience different from what you had expected? I guess electrical engineering was different from what you had envisioned before. But then what about like over time as you kept studying? Did you find yourself like, okay, this is really what I want to, what I want to do? Or were you getting further away from what you had envisioned? No, it, it was the further I was, uh, like the more courses I took, the more time I spent on it. Uh, it was just kind of reaffirming that th this is my passion. Even to, to this day, I, I feel like every day I'm <laughs> deeper and deeper in a topic and more curious to the point now where I'm pretty much spending all of my awake time thinking about this topic, which I don't know how healthy it is. But, but I, I do have to say there there's a really big contribution from the university itself because those moments that I was talking about earlier where I, I was discouraged because of the complexity of the topic here it was there was a lot of uh, student groups that that I joined and that was available to me where people were dealing with I mean working on the same things so of course in, as an engineer it's very rarely when you're completely alone with a problem you're solving mm -hmm. and then I think that that was really really helpful and like a game changer to to have yeah just other curious people around you that want to do the same thing and then you kind of build on top of each other and also having uh, professors that are readily available for you outside the courses and happy to talk about anything not just the topic they teach and this is usually the the topic that i touch on when people ask me like what so what's the difference between good and bad university and because better ranked university and not so highly ranked university and talking with different people and through my experience been in multiple uh, institutions, I guess, multiple universities. The courses are the same. I mean, the laws of physics are <laughs> the same in every university. You, 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 and most likely you, you have the same textbooks and the same syllabus and all of that. But it's the outside activities that that happen besides courses, the the student groups, the the willingness of other students to do something beyond like what's required by course mm -hmm. uh, i think that's that's where i felt the difference between better and not so good uh, ranking universities what advice would you give maybe some high school students listening to this who want to go into engineering but they're not really sure if it's for them yeah so i i think it's um if i just talk about engineering like broadly engineering it, maybe it's uh, not fair for me to to give advice I could I could give about my field mm -hmm. and a very nice part about my field of uh, again doing kind of half electronics half software is that you can you can test it today like uh, you can you can uh, get your hands dirty right away you don't have to uh, wait for yeah to to get to any course or anything like mm -hmm. that it's it's quite readily available and that that would be my advice to to just try it out. Of course, software, you only need a computer. And most likely, if you're listening to this, you have a computer. Yeah. And and today, also electronics there, it's a very low barrier to get some, like a starter kit that will teach you some basics. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't, not, not that it's just like a low barrier in terms of cost and and availability, but also like the the sheer amount of like different, different kits that you can get and different types of sensors and and even like if you have preference for any programming language you can even target to towards that it, it used to be uh only c language that was used for electronics uh but now most of the languages can be used to program electronics so mm -hmm. yeah the the excuses are the amount of excuses you can have not to do something is smaller and smaller okay i think that's great advice to just try it out yeah, yeah. and Again, it, it's hard for me to say for other topics. I don't know if for mechanical engineering, I guess that's also, you you could try out some stuff. Yeah, but I do uh, think it's a little bit more difficult to envision what you will be doing yeah. in mechanical engineering. Because especially in the beginning, like the first two years are just math and physics kind of basics that you learn. And then you only apply it much later, uh, at least where I studied, it was the case. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I had no idea what I was going to be working with. So I wouldn't have known even what to try out. Yeah. I mean, I, I think when you asked me, like, if I knew, uh, if I had some 
role model engineers around me when I was growing up because I didn't I, I didn't also see that part what could I be doing with this uh, knowledge the only thing I knew is it was that it was fun what I <laughs> what you could build I didn't even think that far of like how could this be useful to anybody mm. yeah I was just wondering when I asked about mechanical engineering is there any equivalent like starter kits where you will like mm. try something and I don't know why every time I imagine uh, mechanical engineering I, I, I automatically go to robotics and I know that's <laughs> the only thing mechanical engineers do so but yeah I guess it is one of the things you can best try out you probably don't want to I don't know try out making simulations no need a lot of math that you haven't learned yet but I guess you could get like a lego robotic set or Mm -hmm. any kind of like building kit like that that teaches you a little bit about the mechanics of a little car or something like that mm -hmm. also about the different components that work together which is i mean not the og mechanic engineering is just the pure mechanics but now it's a lot of robotics and then you do have some mm -hmm. electronics in there you have software as well and so there are some i think like robotics kits that can really teach you how these things work together yeah i guess mechatronics would be what you're talking about yeah maybe that's yeah. actually the best present i guess now i feel like i'm advertising some of the toys <laughs> and, uh, but yeah get m mechatronics kit then you also get this part of building actual mechanical parts you get some electronics and you do have some software mm. and just see what you enjoy the most out of it and i guess you have to enjoy some out of it because that's the yeah i'm just kidding no if i if, if i guess if you don't like any of it then there are plenty of other engineering subjects and then Let's say this uh, high school student started studying engineering or specifically computer engineering or something in the field, and they're on their first day. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any advice for how they can like, make it through their studies <laughs> in the most intact way? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a marathon, not, not, a, not a sprint for sure. So I wouldn't base my expectation too much on like uh, one day, right? But one good thing... Uh, at least in American universities, maybe you can help me with your undergraduate experience in, in Europe. You could be undecided for a while, meaning like not declare your major. It doesn't have to be completely open-ended. You could be like, oh, I want to study something in STEM or engineering. And there are courses that all of the engineers take, mm. especially like just math and physics. And later on, then you can pick. So that, that buys you some time. Mm -hmm. and and i yeah i think that really helps i i again i didn't go through that so i don't want to speak like i know exactly what thought process you go through uh I, again i was lucky enough that i knew exactly what what i want to do but there is that freedom i don't know if um so in berlin you had that or so no in germany not and i mm -hmm. i haven't heard this from other universities so i think in europe it's generally the case that you apply for a specific major and then you only follow that program however there are so many courses that are shared between all of the engineering disciplines so that people would still very frequently switch majors maybe half a year in or one year or even maybe two years in mm -hmm. without really losing any time because it was you know you could still go from mechanic engineering to civil engineering because some people realize oh then i don't have to do as much math and i don't have to do dynamic mechanics i only have to do the statics so maybe I don't want to do that. And so I'll go into civil engineering. So you can still do that, but you should be pretty sure that you want to do engineering at least. Yeah. In order to maybe like not lose. Anything. Yeah. I mean, I think it's also completely fine to lose some time to just like study something random for a year and then say, oh, that's not what I want. I'm going to do something else. What do you think? Is that? <laughs> no, I, I mean, according to many people and now that I told part of my university story I, I lost three years I, I mean yeah. once I finished or like once I dropped out, out of business school that, that was three years put in university and I started literally from zero after mm. but I don't see that as lost at all and the reason why I don't see it as, as lost time again it made me realize what I really want to do and I think that's worth all the money so to speak I, I know it's a big problem uh, I mean a lot of people struggle throughout most of their life to to find what what they was their passion so i yeah i think on the on the grand scheme three years is nothing uh, but going back to choosing your engineering major losing course here or there and again it's like with quote marks losing like, you did study something you could 
and use it in other science fields or engineering fields. Mm. And maybe it's even an advantage that you saw different disciplines. And then usually in one example is in my field where it's I work closely with software and hardware. There is a lot of good practices that computer science has that could be, be used in electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. But if you if you didn't have uh, any contact with computer science courses, you would never realize that. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> far from having it as a loss, maybe it's like I said, advantage. And so going back to giving advice to someone who's starting their degree, would you say there's anything they should prioritize or like where they should pay the most attention or put the most effort into? Mm -hmm. I, I think right away you should try building something like having hands-on experience because if I if I went through university without ever trying to make something, maybe I would again go through the same thought process of like, okay, we are just like solving some problems on the whiteboard for the sake of solving a problem that that always like demotivated me. Yeah, not not having a connection of why we are learning this. I think it's very hard, and I think universities still do really bad job with that. So unfortunately, you kind of have to do it yourself, but. You have to realize that you have to do this. So it's kind of, <clears throat> it's hard. Yeah. Yeah, I did that mm. mistake. I wish I had actually kind of taken more control over my studies. In the beginning, I was just kind of lost in the math and physics courses. And I didn't really understand. I didn't explain like, what do you need that stuff for? It seemed kind of like, okay, I just have to learn this. <laughs> I don't know if I will use this ever again. And I definitely don't enjoy this. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not saying that I, I did it perfectly. I did a few of the courses related directly to my major. So like uh, tinkering with electronics, I, I covered that part. The math part, I, I struggled my whole life and throughout the university and every math course I, I like hated. Like I could not wait to, to finish it. But just because of that feeling of solving problems just for sake of like being busy with mm -hmm. your mind, like creating busy work for you for nothing. Yeah. Um, but... I, I do regret it now because I, I always, when I talk with my uh, colleagues, I, I always say uh, the only reason why I'm not using some parts of uh, my education doesn't have to be math, but most like more, more most often it is math. Uh, the only reason why I'm not using some parts of it is because I I forgot it. Not not because it's not useful. Yeah. I, I'm just like solving my problems, dodging that solution, but. A lot of times they're like straightforward solution if you have this tool, but mm -hmm. I just forgot a lot of tools. Yeah, and I guess why you forget some something is because you don't learn it by reasoning and intuition. You kind of just cram it to you figure out what's gonna be on the test, <laughs> and you figure out how to solve the test. And and again, I I don't uh, I mean I did that, <clears throat> and I know I'll, most of the students do that, but I think university is guilty of having that style i know it's like a, a huge shift in the philosophy of uh, teaching but it has to happen at some point or mm. or it doesn't hopefully it will happen at some point yeah okay so to summarize a little bit the advice here um first of all take advantage of being able to maybe not declare your major yeah. try out different types of engineering then take control by building stuff yourself and using the things that you learn and yeah um yeah, I, and it doesn't have to be, again, on, on your own, like making stuff. Just look at what student clubs are there. Hmm. Okay. And if there is no student club that you're looking for to make one. Yeah, Yeah. true. Why not? And uh, pay attention in math class. <laughs> I mean, pay at like, I don't think that paying attention is hard. I think it's hard uh, what you mentioned, like finding the connection with mm. why are we doing this. Yeah. And ironically, like sometimes even professors don't know why you're studying that. Uh, like not why, like they can uh, explain the math concept and they're, mm. and they're mathematicians. Like you said, there are a lot of different majors in the classroom and a chemical engineer might use this, that the tool that you are learning now in, not might, for sure they're going to use it in different setup than an electrical engineer. So yeah. the professor is neither of those two. <laughs> so they yeah. can tell you like, oh, when you get into this situation when you're designing, I don't know, the distribution system for electrical energy, then you're going to need, need this tool. And then you're like, oh, I have to really pay attention to this. But, yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. And it's always mathematicians teaching math. I mean, it makes sense, of course. But Yeah. Okay. But then they also love to show you exactly how you can derive the functions that you use. 
which you're never going to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is going to turn into shitting on math <laughs> podcast. Uh, but uh, it, it's a tool that everybody needs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. And so after your bachelor's studies, you started to work as an engineer. So yeah. could you talk a little bit about what it was like to look for your first job, how you looked for that job and then how you managed to find one and also to choose which one to go for? Yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm afraid my story is not going to be so useful because it's kind of, again, there's a lot of chances. Mm-hmm. But I guess, uh, I don't know from who who's this quote, but like the harder you work, the luckier you get, technically. But because I was living at that time in New York City, pretty expensive place to live a lot of my um a lot of my time was going towards like how how do i survive not like how do i pass courses like how do i pay off my life like how do i get stuff to eat right Mm -hmm. so most of and the reason why i'm saying is that most most of my time went into having random jobs around the school that that are paying the most like that that was my goal like what is the highest hourly wage that i can get i don't care what the job is and yeah, so how is this relevant is that I I never had internship. And I know a lot of people have summer internships, uh, internships throughout uh, uh, semesters. I hope the situation is better. But uh, at the time when I was looking for internships, more, most of them were unpaid. Yeah. And I, I literally could not afford that. So there is there's that disadvantage. I do recommend getting internships. I mean, it's like the most real experience you can get. I mean, I heard there are some good and bad internships i I don't know (laughs) but i i I would i do recommend it so i I finished my university and i had zero experience so what helped here a lot was i mean when i say zero experience zero experience is working in companies i had a lot of experience making stuff essentially that that turned into my cv i mean of course i had my cv or resume depends where you're from uh but what people like seeing is if you have some kind of portfolio Hmm. and and that you're able to talk about those uh, projects, and then then like your your um, uh, your GPA or like your grades kind of don't matter that much when you have like real work to show. Hmm. So that was very helpful. Um, I did apply to a lot of uh, jobs anywhere in the United States, pretty much, uh, and it, it, I just like it fell flat. Like I, I wasn't getting any responses. Uh, but one day my uh, electronics professor like calls me over after a class and he's like, oh, I have this, uh, there's this one man band, one, one guy uh, company, uh, he's looking for some help or summer in electronics. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because uh, he knew what I was, how passionate I was. And I, I was actually one of the better students in the, the course. He was like, oh, I, I'm thinking about recommending you. Are you interested? Uh, so I was like, oh, of course, like, uh, I mean, this would be the first time I'm <laughs> doing what I'm studying, actually, not some physical labor. It turned out to be this, uh, this small studio in, in Brooklyn where this, I, I mean, I call him mentor named William. Uh, he, yeah, he took me over for the summer. He was working on some projects, uh, in the domain of like toys <laughs> and he, he was doing contract work and he was also a toy inventor. So how, how toy inventing works is you make a concept like proof of concept or some prototype and then you go to big toy company you pitch it and hope they buy your idea and then you get royalties or whatever deal you make Mm -hmm. so so that was my first experience um where yeah where i was like using my brain at work uh and that lasted for a few months uh but that was i knew it was only a few months Mm -hmm. Because he just needed help for a very specific project, but so I was still looking for for work, uh, for like long term, full time employment. And when I said uh, there's a lot of like this luck or chance, the, the last day uh, I was in Will's uh, studio talking what I'm doing next. I I, grad- I finished university and and I was like I have no idea actually what I'm doing and <laughs> and and the project was over with him so. He was like, all right. In in the afternoon of the last day, he gets a phone call. It's a, from a big toy company. And they're like, oh, we are looking for electronics engineer entry level. Do you know anybody like who you could recommend? And he was like, he's literally standing next to me. <laughs> and yeah, so I, and, and yeah, somebody just, a recruiter found him on LinkedIn, just looking, mm. uh, searching based on credentials or whatever. 
so yeah, very random. Mm. And uh, yeah, before before I knew it, like I was uh, flying to Los Angeles to have an interview <laughs> at a big toy company. Yeah, <laughs> very, like I said, just being at the right time and in the right place. And you got the job. Yeah, so that that was uh, I, I went through force first like uh, phone interview or whatever but then I, I visited the company and there I had my interview with uh, multiple engineers that I was going to work with and I had like a practical test that was yeah almost like university uh, just pen and paper uh, and yes I was I was hired <laughs> <laughs> and then what did you do in that job specifically it, it was a really not weird experience very very different from university and and was like a culture shock but in the positive sense because I, I went from only hanging out with engineers and being in, in that engineering bubble and there is like there's similarities between engineers <laughs> of course uh but it, then i was thrown into this company where it was a few hundred people uh in office in, in los angeles and and out of that there was maybe 15 engineers and most of the people were designers and it was really fun to like hang out with people that are artsy and suddenly like oh my people that i know know how to draw are like wow <laughs> they're like create music and stuff like that uh, i mean of course there are some engineers that do that but not professionally and, and my job was to get a, co- a toy concept from a designer or to work with a designer to get out get to some idea of uh, some toy then that would go through the prototyping stage so I would usually work uh, with industrial engineer who would do the mechanical part or with a uh, mechanical engineer. Uh, my job was to do the electronics and some kind of prototyping, uh, so, sorry, some kind of uh, programming to get to the prototype. Uh, then once we had the prototype, then it will go through this kind of approval stage, like if it's fun enough, cool enough. I don't know. Uh, there's, a, of course, input from like marketing department. They would say like is this what kids want now and then if it goes through all those stages it's approved for uh, mass production then you would design everything for it's called dfm so the design for manufacturing yeah once you get to the state or when it's ready to like press button and make a million of uh, same thing uh then there is like some support with factory and uh, then like i would just move on to the next Mm -hmm. next product next toy Okay. So that was kind of like the cycle of uh, one product. Hmm. And what's the difference in like the first design that you would do and then the design for manufacturing? Well, I mean, so in, in the prototype, you you just uh, you, you for sure you're not uh, concerned about cost. You're just taking whatever available tools are there or like components, and usually you take something much more capable than it necessary that it, than it is necessary. And it just uh, what that means is. It allows you to develop faster. Uh, you don't have so many constraints. You don't have to be so... It's so efficient. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. uh, for example, even just with the battery, you don't have to worry about battery life or anything. I mean, it just has to last for like 10 minutes to demo it. Yeah. Um, but all of this needs to happen fast, right? Or much faster than uh, designing for manufacturing. And you start with a lot of prototypes and not all of them go through, through like... Uh, I mean, a lot of them get dropped. Mm-hmm. So, because you have like a lot of projects... You have less time to work on them. And once you get to designing for manufacturing, then then it's like trying to save every cent everywhere. Uh, and then you have to keep in mind uh, how how is the machine gonna assemble that? Um, what are the capabilities of machines assembling that? What is if it's on a machine? If it's a human putting it together, you're trying to make the least number of steps that they have to take, mm. and because it's also cost saving because you're paying somebody per hour. I actually per- like that part more than uh, prototyping okay. uh, because I, I think that's where like your engineering uh, knowledge really kicks in because prototyping again it just has to work for 10 minutes <laughs> after that it can catch fire or whatever <laughs> yeah and that, that also required me going to factory <laughs> I guess you have a lot of experience uh, with that uh, I, I like doing that I didn't have to do anything close to <laughs> what you were doing I mean spend that much time but I had opportunity to fly to uh, Hong Kong and China to because things were made there, mm-hmm. um, and we would go there maybe once a year or something like that in during like the manufacturing season, I guess. Mm. That sounds like a really cool job. It, it's a uh, it was really fun. I mean, my my desk was covered in toys always. Um, 
and and you, know, you spend a lot of time testing toys, but you catch yourself like testing in a little bit longer than is necessary. Like then you catch yourself, oh, I'm actually playing with a toy. Like I tested what I needed to test, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and so then, why did you decide? Or when did you decide to move on from that job? And what did you do next? Yeah, so I, I spent about three years uh, in there. Mm -hmm. And there are these uh, cycles that I explained with the product, like from the concept to product being on the shelf hmm. um, and in, on the shelf in the store. Yeah. Uh, and that usually lasts for a year. And there's a very strong deadline. It's uh, Christmas, right? And hmm. uh, if if you you can't miss <laughs> Christmas, like if you miss Christmas, then we might as well not make not you better not make it because then everything is lost because the trends are changing so fast. Most likely that toy will not be interesting next year. Hmm. Um, maybe some uh, some uh, small change or something like that. But anyway, so I, I stayed uh, through three cycles. Like I was there for three years. Hmm. And yeah. it was kind of, it started being repetitive in a sense that from engineering point of view. Like it was, it was really fun to to always work on uh, like different toys and they, they have like different, um, different, uh, I don't know, the different way, ways you play with them, different personalities. Mm -hmm. uh, but from an engineering point of view, it was always like relatively the same requirements. It has to make some sound. It has to have some inputs, buttons, some kind of sensors, some few motors, and maybe that's it. And it is limiting in that sense that, uh, of course, a, a toy cannot be thousands of euros. I mean, there are some toys, I guess, but but you do want to keep it, I don't know, up to 50 euros, mm -hmm. which really puts a hard limit on how much uh, cost of goods sold can co cost, <laughs> how much cost of goods sold can be, meaning how much you pay factory to get your your product, mm. which again means that electronics are really constrained and constrained and mm. you can't experiment with something fancier. And in, in toy world, for example, Bluetooth and wireless is considered fancy. <laughs> and, and, and I did want it to work on like more complex systems so then i slowly started looking okay what's the next step mm. so that was that those three years uh, in toys yeah so then what was the next step yeah so uh, on one part i i wanted to uh for because I, I was spending outside work I, uh, most of my free time i was spending watching lectures on youtube or something like mm. that so then i started thinking it, it would it would be fun to maybe go to grad school and kind of be back into that environment where, yeah, where I'm again surrounded by curious people that just want to innovate and yeah, pretty much li like-minded people. That was one part. Then I had some personal goals or whatever. I did want to move uh, to Europe. And ironically, I am from geographically, like I spent my first 18 years in Europe, but it was almost 18 years in one city yeah. <laughs> or one town. So I, I didn't really see Europe and I, I wanted to experience life in Europe. I wanted to be closer to my family and so on. So that that was like the personal part. Mm. And uh, also there was, <laughs> my girlfriend was starting a startup here in Stockholm uh, where my skills could really help her. So a lot of things aligned and I applied to go to uh, KTH, uh, Royal Institute of Technology for to study embedded systems. And yeah. I ended up doing everything. So I ended up getting into the program and ended up working uh, on the startup um, no, I don't necessarily recommend it because it's not super balanced life. Yeah. But that, that was my next move. Yeah. yeah. So then what was it that you studied? The major was called Embedded Systems. Yeah. And uh, can you explain like what that means? Yeah. So, I, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of people don't know what it means. And it's just because you don't use it in a day-to-day -day language, right? But it pretty much just means combination of hardware and some software and made designed for a specific purpose. So embedded into something. And so uh, example would be like a, a microwave. I mean, it has it has its own display. It's, I don't know. I guess there are some internet connected microwaves. To the, I don't know. But it has some some processor that is running on there. So it's you, you have that piece of electronics that has software running on it designed for a specific use for warming up the food like it's as opposed to a uh, general purpose computer or smartphone anything like that for right it's not just like single thing that you do with it i don't okay. know if that yeah. uh, helps <laughs> i think so i hope so um <laughs> and so then what was it like for you 
to start studying this master. I mean, now studying for the first time back in Europe, in Sweden. Yeah. So, I mean, it was really nice to also have this uh, European style uh, university, which was, I found it very, very different than uh, American experience. There are some pros and cons. Uh, like one thing was uh, in the US, you would, like if you fail the final exam of a course, you get, let's say you get an F in that course. Uh, you have to retake that course in order to finish your degree. If, if that course was like one of the mandatory ones. Mm. Uh, but that F stays in your grade point average. Mm -hmm. Where here it was nice, at least in Sweden, it's like, okay, you failed the exam. That just means like you have to retake it. It's not like, yeah, it goes, F goes on your record or something. I mean, it goes, but like once you get a better... Uh, mark then that overtakes the lower one yeah so and what that means i mean i liked it because it was uh less uh less less pressure i guess less uh yeah it was a little bit less stressful in that sense what about the content of the master was this kind of what you expected how did you even decide to do embedded systems how did you know what it was but <laughs> now it is i don't know i mean i i was working in that field so i know exactly what the embedded system yeah. is it it's i mean i at this point we talked about electrical engineering uh, computer engineering and so on like all of these are within each major you, you can skew your courses to almost look like another one so there, there is not um, a huge difference and, and it just depends on your choice of what you are interested w within that major. Embedded system is, is, I guess it sounds a little bit more specific than computer engineering. Uh, so that's why it's on the master's level. So I guess a little bit more specific, but what it boils down to is electronics that have software. And like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. At this point, I, I, again, I had this like struggles with under, uh, like being like too much theoretical, but I guess that that is master's level. But I had this huge advantage over most of the students who didn't have work experience that I knew exactly where I would use the concepts that yeah. we were studying. And I could see the fr frustration in my fellow students, colleagues, or however you call them, colleague students, where they were like, why do I need to know this random thing? And yeah, some, sometimes I could have helped with that, explaining uh, some stuff. But yeah, again, I, I saw a big difference in the students that were trying to... Um, do something on their own and students that were there for for the experience i guess mm. um again i was pretty lucky uh, i mean we both are to go to kth that had outside the course groups that were well very well supported so mm. if you wanted to do more stuff you could and do you feel like it was good that you did the master did it give you more value than you know you already had from the work experience um, yeah, I mean, it definitely like gave me a new tool set. The way I'm looking at the, the education is like putting stuff in my toolbox. So I learn, I, I gain a lot of new tools that I, I don't think I would stumble upon if, I mean, I would maybe stumble upon, but then it will be by chance. This was like, this is the direction that it will be helpful for you to go in. Mm -hmm. Like that, that was, that's what I get from university. And then from there, like you can research it on your own. So that that was the uh, yeah it, it was definitely helpful. But as I mentioned, like in the same time, I was working sometimes even forty hours a week while going full time to the school, and and I started having this feeling as well where like well on one hand uh, I'm helping friends build startup, uh, we are solving real issue, I'm building real product. I, I was a little bit demotivated to solve made up problems in a classroom. Mm. Uh, and especially at this point, I, w I was, it wasn't like in my bachelor's where I was like tinkering with stuff here again, I was making real stuff and I was paid for it. Yeah. So, and the more I worked on it, the more I was paid <laughs> for it. So yeah, th there was a little bit of the conflict there. Mm. Um, regardless of that, I, I, I do think uh, it, it was useful to go to a grad school. How did you manage to do both things? Like. Do you have any secrets for time? No, I mean, uh, I, I my I wasn't scoring so well on the exams. I mean, I was I never in my life I failed a course. I'm pretty proud of that. But or I guess I don't. I, I don't know if I should be. Maybe sometimes you should just let it go. Maybe I don't know. I'm, I'm taking back that I'm proud of that. But the <laughs> fact is, I never failed a course, so I always got like at least the minimum to pass, which was that was not ideal because I, I again I, I fell back into that habit of just studying to pass a course not studying to really understand mm. uh, the topic unless it was somehow directly related to my work then it was useful um, uh, 
yeah, I, I wish I had more time to to dive deeper into some topics. Mm. But my social life definitely suffered. Uh, I didn't get to connect with other students uh, as much as I, I wish, like uh, as much as it will be good. Mm. Um, so yeah, th- there's no secret. You just it's a trade off. <laughs> yeah, but that's also where we met. Like, exactly around that time. Yeah, living in the same dorm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually forgot that we were in the same dorm. Yeah. There was this party outside of the dorm, like at the laundry room. Yeah, well, you have to explain why the laundry room, do you know? I guess because we didn't have a common room. Exactly. Yeah. But but the laundry room, the only people that can enter is if you schedule laundry itself, right? So yeah. people organize themselves to, and you can schedule, I don't know, two or three hours. Yeah. So people organize back to back, I mean, schedule back to back laundry room so we can use laundry room as party room because it had like a really big uh, area i mean like double it's it's not like i, I was uh, partying next to washing machine there it's like a, a extra room for i don't even know what for like for folding your stuff i guess <laughs> for ironing your clothes yeah but i mean that that's before i forget that was one of my maybe even more than 50 percent of the motivation to go to grad school is to meet people that are like I said, like-minded people, mm. ambitious people. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, that's part of my regret that I, that part I didn't do as well as I was hoping for. And was there anything like besides that, you know, studying and working that was very difficult for you during the studies? I mean, so this was very specific because it started great, but then COVID happened um, and uh, and then it wasn't great anymore. <laughs> uh, I so yeah, maybe it's worth to explain at this point that uh, the master degree that I was pursuing uh, was uh, it's called dual degree, and it was between two universities. Hmm. And the idea was to study you know, first year in one university, and then second year finish your degree in a different university. So you would have entry and exit university. That's how they call it. I, I really recommend the program. Actually, it's called the uh, EIT Digital. And so my entry university was KTH and the exit was your alumni, the Technical University Berlin. Yeah. And in my case, the when I was studying, the COVID happened after the first semester. So already the second semester, all the courses were online in KTH. I already really didn't like that, uh, especially because then I was even spending more time working because there was, that social part was removed. But anyway, I, I, f- I finished the KTH part and I was supposed to move to Berlin, but uh, Germany was much more strict than Sweden. So I was with, uh, in contact with the people from my program who already moved to Berlin and they were saying how they can't even like leave their apartment while I was able to leave my apartment at least in mm-hmm. Sweden. So I decided to wait a little bit. The school already started um, and the courses started fully online. So I, I started taking the courses online and um, and I, I kept thinking like, okay, I, I'm going to wait a few more weeks and I'm going to look for an apartment uh, and so on. But that that never happened. And I, then I realized, okay, I'm staying in Sweden, uh, especially because I was working in Sweden. Hmm. And uh, I finished a full semester uh, in Berlin. Ironically, at, at, this, at that point, I'd never been to Germany. <laughs> and, and I had a, a student ID card that says Technical University of Berlin, and I can take a bus for free in Berlin if I want to. <laughs> and But what was really big difference is that in Stockholm, I already knew people, and that we, like, sorry, I already knew people, and then we switched to this online part. So, like, I kind of made my social circle. Mm. In Berlin, I met literally zero students. Uh, there were some group assignments, but we will just join in the call to, to do it. And, I mean, it's not like you stay after call and you're like, so what did you have for lunch? Or, I don't know. <laughs> it was, yeah. uh, and and then it was time to do the thesis, and I was just like, uh, no way, <laughs> I'm not doing thesis uh, online without. Yeah, it was like so so alien to me to do it like this. Mm. So uh, yet again, I dropped out from university. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Surprise. Yeah. <laughs> are are you gonna not air the episode anymore? <laughs> what is this Twitter? And you were still working at um imagilabs at the time yeah the company is called imagilabs now they rebranded just to imagi uh, oh really okay. yeah it's simpler yeah uh at the time I, w- I was working but i was finishing my part of the work uh, 
BDM. So what what they're doing is making programmable uh, gadget, which is like uh, eight by eight pixels, uh, small variable electronics that you program from your phone, and and it's designed for, uh, for complete beginners to to learn Python. And what is convenient with them is that most of the kids at that age are spending their time on the phones. They're maybe not so interested in computers. So it was just uh, kind of getting that programming experience closer to to kids and more user-friendly. So uh, it, I was working on uh, the hardware part. And at that, po- at that point, the hardware part was in the mass production. Uh, there was not, I mean, it was just supporting it at that time. and. Definitely was not a uh, full time, or not even part time. <laughs> just maybe hour here, here or there. Mm. Um, and in the same time, I was looking for a uh, thesis, and I really wanted to work at Ericsson because it was like big Swedish company. Five uh, G uh, was getting uh, yeah. COVID was getting big. <laughs> but uh, jokes aside, I, I did want to work on it because it, it's like a state of art i guess to to work on uh, radios that communicate on a 5g network and when i was looking for a thesis there i didn't like any of the topics in the same list when you were like looking for jobs they are like real job postings and i was like oh but this this will be the job that i would apply after the thesis and this job looks really cool um and then i thought like why why don't i just apply for that job directly because why would i do this like uh, roundabout to to get to it if they accept me now then who cares if i did the thesis in ericsson or not i mean mm-hmm. I, I would end up at the same spot i applied for uh uh yeah position that was working on the one of the 5g radios and and i got that and that was another reason where i was like okay for, for sure that i'm not doing <laughs> any yeah anything academically mm-hmm. so then I was uh, suddenly at Ericsson. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your job then at Ericsson? Yeah, so, I mean, my my official title was a software developer, actually, which was a big change in titles <laughs> so far because everything, uh, uh, every time up until this point, it was always like electronics something, hardware something. And going back to, talk, uh, to talking about labels, now I was software developer. And again, I was doing pretty much the same stuff. I was in the embedded systems. I, I was, I mean, because there's so it's a, such a big company, so many groups or like so many, yeah, employees in a very complex system. So that, then you have really specialized positions. So I was writing software for a piece of hardware that was running on the the radio, like the white boxes that you see outside on the street, like on the roofs of buildings, uh, which is a radio that your phone connects to. <laughs> Ericsson was, I guess, the largest company you had worked for up to that point, right? Yeah, by far. In California, the toy company that I was working for, by the way, called Spin Master, um, it was, I think, up to thousand-ish people. Mm-hmm. And the office that I was in, that wasn't a headquarter. And it was maybe 300, 400 people. Uh, and then besides that, it was a lot of startups that I was, that I was like either employed at or just helping out. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, Ericsson, I don't know, global... Globally, like fifty, sixty thousand, or maybe more. I don't know. I think uh, headquarters, which is where I worked at, is about ten thousand people, something like that. Okay. So, what was that like going from smaller companies to this big company? Well, I mean, that answering that question was actually one of my partially why I wanted to work at a place like that because I I wanted to see how it is when you are surrounded with so many engineers with so many years of experience. It was the the intro was uh, pretty good because it's not the first time they're hiring somebody. So you have a pretty set path. You have exactly like what you do and to onboard uh, everything documented, every, like everything in detail, how how it's done. So from from that side, if you are a person that likes that, to, if if you are a person that likes to be kind of told like this is the problem we are working on, like very specifically, and we're gonna take care of everything else. You just focus on this one thing. And then, then it's a great place. Uh, for me, it was too too limiting. I I, I wanted to have, like be I guess more creative uh, about the solutions mm. um, because here, <laughs> as a, because I was working as a software developer, the, there was a solution already. I just had to put it in the code. So of course, it's not as straightforward. Just like type it out. Like you, you still have to 
do quite a bit of engineering, but but you already knew like everything that's gonna happen. You just have to make sure it happens, I guess. But yeah, so that was that was quite different. Mm, and that was last year, right? That was twenty twenty one to twenty twenty two. Yeah, like, I don't know. overlapping. But yeah, it didn't last too long because of what I just mentioned. I did want want to have more creativity, and I wanted to work on more more things. Which and when I say more things, like I I realized at that point I could not give up on hardware. Like I I like designing also the electronics, which means just simply I can't work on such complex system because there's no way one person could cover the five G thing. Yeah. So yeah, it, it just simply wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I quit one with. <laughs> No, but I, I, it's just like, I, I think it's all part of like learning who you are and what works for you. And mm. yeah, you just, yeah. The, the, the great thing is that you have so many opportunities to try. Are there any like kind of signs that you, from which you tell like when to quit something or when to move on to something new? Uh, I mean, I try to play this game or whatever. It's like you, you go through the like next step, like, okay, if when I finish this, what's gonna happen next and what's gonna happen next and, and so on. And like the way I was looking at it is if everything goes all, all right, like what's the best I can ever be in this this position? And let's say that was like some really high up engineer or manager, I don't know. And then I would ask myself in, in terms of Ericsson where there's like so many layers. Um then I would ask myself in the best case scenario, would I be happy with with that um in that case the answer was no so that, that's one thing and another thing is like if you start hoping that the culture is going to change or something big that is really out of your reach then i also think it's a good sign because most likely something like that will not change it, it's a different if you're like working on a on a product that you're not so interested in, but okay maybe that product is, is going to go away i don't know in a year and you're going to be working on something else but you really like the team it's really inspiring then for sure like that that thing is going to that's going to change. And mm-hmm. then it's up to you, like, okay, do you want to suck it up and push through it? Or or you think you can't even do that. But yeah, again, like if, if you're like, <laughs> I don't know, if you're working on cars and you're like, oh, I wish these are going to, the company is going to pick up making planes, then I, <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't <laughs> wait for that. Yeah. yeah. So then what did you decide to do after Ericsson? Yeah, so I, I think... Uh, I mean, I at this point, like I, I I've been in a lot of different si- company sizes, different organizations. I, I think I had a quite variety of experience where I I finally didn't feel like oh there's just this one more setting that I have to try and then I will know all the set. like I I felt quite at peace that I like now I, I I can really like sit down and think like what I learned from all of these ex- experiences hmm. and. And one of that was like the the level of complexity of the product that I want to work. It, by nature, it has to be a lower complexity because I do want to understand the whole product. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, like I said, I didn't want to. I really did not want to separate uh, software and hardware, which is in some way speci- specialization. And you get into that specialization quite fast. And like after maybe 30, 40 people a company, you start falling into one of those. So that also set like the size of the company or size of the team that I want to work on. So knowing all of these parameters and yeah, learning about myself and also kind of like just the maturity that you get by just by being older, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I also uh, decided that I want to do something on my own. Like I, I, I was at the right time where I didn't have huge responsibilities in terms of uh, uh, nobody was depending on uh, my income or anything like that. Mm. Uh, so I, I felt that I had quite a bit of freedom and I, I, I wanted to start something on my own. I didn't have an idea for product or anything like that, so I, I decided to start consulting and freelancing, mm-hmm. um, which is kind of what I'm doing now. Yeah. Finally, you arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, at the now. So um, how did you decide what to offer and how did you find your first clients? Yeah, so the, unfortunately with the clients, like you do, uh, I mean, the easiest way, the one that I did was um, just... It, it was people that I made contacts throughout my career, mm. and like, I I knew what their com- their company is doing. They already knew me, so there was no like uh, some interview process or right? they they seen my work before. Yeah. So I contacted people that at one point contacted me asking if I want to work there or, or if I can help them with something. Yeah, pretty fast. I I was busy uh, <laughs> doing stuff, 
uh, unfortunately, like I, I, I don't know how it is to. I didn't put like any ads or anything like that, hmm. so I can't really advise on how you do that. And and usually consultants are a little bit later in career because of just the network. Yeah. So then, what and, kind of work do you do? Oh yeah, what what I was offering. I, so I noticed uh, there there is this pattern uh, in at least in Stockholm. It's a pretty good place. With, there's a lot of startups, uh, and what I noticed in hardware startups is. Well, of course, you need somebody that does the hardware part, which is unfortunately pretty scarce. I, I think tinkering with, with electronics is, or like working on electronics is getting less and less popular with younger people. Um, and even in my generation already, like most of the people that I, that were studying with me uh, would go into purely software after it. Mm-hmm. There there are more jobs there. And I think it's a slower barrier for, for you to experiment with it. But even though there are more jobs in software, I think now because of lack of people in uh, on the hardware part, there there is really need for for hardware people, which works out really nicely for me because, yeah, I, I have some room to choose. Yeah, so the the gap that I've seen with a lot of uh, hardware startups or smaller companies is that first of all they need somebody with the skill set that I have, but they also don't need that person throughout the whole lifetime of the company because usually you make a product and then once it's being produced, uh, and if you're not making changes, then you just order more from wherever it's produced. You don't really some you don't really need somebody, you know, sitting eight hours in your office. And that's exactly the experience where I had where uh, working in a toy company really helped because throughout each season, uh, I would work I uh, between five and ten toys. So each year I would have experiences of that many products making it from scratch, uh, which gives me a pretty good understanding of what it takes uh, to produce something or like to mass produce it and and also what it takes to prototype it so there is this like yeah this kind of like the way i see myself almost like jack of all trades in in world of electronics which again it it doesn't work everywhere for highly specialization part like no there are people with way more knowledge than me in that specific thing but for startups that's usually what's needed you you want somebody to make a widget um, and to cover most of the engineering disciplines in that one product. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you, um, because you told me that you recently also started a new job besides the freelancing. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. that? So th- there was a company called Quantify. I spend part of my time working as employee now. Initially, I, I mean, I also contacted them, as I explained, from the like how I was like reaching out to people. Mm. And I know they needed a medical engineer. Yeah, so I reached out to them, and throughout some talks, we we um, we came to terms that it it makes more sense if I work there, yeah, part time uh, instead of just consulting. Which, from the listener's point of view, it's, it boils down to the same. I, I'm doing the same work whether I'm consulting or not mm. uh, for them. Uh, but what what we are doing there is uh, pretty interesting. It's a it's a startup from uh, KTH, and they're doing water meters. Uh, and for multiple reasons. So w- one is just to measure your water consumption in the apartment, so you can like be build uh, on based on how much water you use. But other reasons where I find more interesting is uh, leakage detection. So if uh, yeah the pipe is cracked or something like that in the apartment uh, or whatever building uses water, then you can uh, you can detect that and much more earlier than you would now in most situations. You just see your wall is wet or something like that and then it's very expensive damage or like in my case where the water came through the lamp like our entire hallway was uh, showering yeah i it wasn't like because of a problem in pipes or something yeah so there was a like a cap on the pipe that rusted off Mm -hmm. and then it just like fell off and it was shooting directly at the lamp the lamp didn't (laughs) stop working it was still on no, so it was like uh, yeah. underwater lamp. Yeah. I mean, there, there are different types of... So there's like eventful bursts like mm-hmm. that. That usually you catch just by being in the place. Yeah. Um, but then there's also like just, you know, slowly dripping. And then like, yeah, a month later, like your paint started, paint started falling off of mm-hmm. the wall or something like that. And that's interesting for insurance companies to... Like, yeah, so the... Yeah, the biggest uh, payout from insurance companies is water damages, which is very interesting because that's not what you people expect. But um, yeah, 
that's the fact. I will not know that. Yeah, so uh, the company is at a really interesting stage uh, where uh, it's beyond that initial startup, uh, like few people trying to make prototype just for a proof of concept. Hmm. It's in the stage of mass production, making it reliable, making it more efficient. Um, it was kind of natural, the stage where I enjoyed the most and they needed somebody like me. So, hmm. so that's then again where you kind of have the experience from the toys, have all the constraints of making it cheap enough to manufacture it in mass production. Yeah. To make yeah. it possible to manufacture. Yeah. What are the kind of things that you think about there? It, it is, uh, yeah, most of the time it is manufacturability. Uh, luckily, it's not as strict as toys. I mean, toys was really cutthroat, like uh, shave every cent. Here, here is not uh, that bad, but uh, there is um, because it's it it is a scale up, uh, like scale up uh, part in the company's history now. So it is just making sure that it's like manufacturable, like mm. the the uh, some. Some things that, like, I don't know if there is like a, a wire going from point A to point B that, like, can that be eliminated or, or the person that is assembling that in a factory, like, can it be automated somehow or just, yeah, just the ways to, to make that process smoother. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, having opportunity to redesign the product from scratch to do that because, like I said, there, it's like that sweet spot between not needing to prove that it's needed, uh, because it's already proven. Um, yeah, having that guarantee that we are going in mass production. Okay. And could you give us a little bit of a visual, like what does your work look like? What are you wearing? Where do you work? <laughs> what do you do during a work day? Uh, I wear pretty much this. <laughs> and I guess I have jeans. I don't know if you can yeah. see that. Um, and also for the listeners. Yeah. Or just t-shirt uh, and jeans. Yeah, there's no dress code. Like what, what you would wear... Like within reason, of course. Mm. But, uh, so not nothing too crazy. Um, I do miss uh, from uh, toy company. My manager at that time, he was also wearing uh, a bunny slippers, and <laughs> I, I thought that was awesome. Yeah. And usually people were wearing like a, a Hawaiian t- uh, button-up shirt or whatever, because it was like uh, yeah, mostly artists. But so it's not that crazy. But yeah, just like t-shirts and jeans. Yeah. Um, and how it looks like, I mean, it's pretty flexible. Like we, most of us start our day around nine, but there are some people that come a little bit earlier, come a little bit later. We start with the like daily stand up, uh, very popular thing in the software world. Mm-hmm. Um, we're just following like, you know, agile methodologies. Um, and yeah. And then if, uh, not if I'm lucky, but mo- most of the day, days like that's the only meeting that we have, uh, that I have, sorry. Um, usually, usually uh, we will have like, if there's like a bigger issue, then maybe we will schedule additional meetings after the one in the morning. But after that, I, I have all the freedom to work and I really like that there is no, that much interruption. Yeah. Mm. So, like I said, because just because of the stage of the company, we know what we want. You just have to like make it happen. Yeah. And do you work at an office then? Mm-hmm. Usually with, with hardware, you end up working at some place because you have to have that hardware mm. or like access to it. Um, but I, I also after COVID experience, I do enjoy being in the office. Yeah. Um, but I have to say I do work part time. So yeah. uh, the other part time that I'm consulting, um, I'm doing that from home. Yeah. And so then when you're doing your focus work, is it in front of a computer most of it or most of it like working with the hardware? What do you do? Yeah, I mean, so right now, just because of my the project that I'm working on, it's purely software. Um, very rarely I um, I have to do some edits on hardware. I mean, the hardware is there in front of myself, but I'm just like uploading new code. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm not changing the hardware itself. So it's mo- mostly programming in C programming language. Mm-hmm. It, that means to anybody anything to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I even learned a little bit of C in my engineering studies. Yeah, I mean, that, that's more, most likely still. If you're doing uh, embedded development, mm. yeah, most likely you're using C. Uh, again, they're, they're like, uh, luckily you can do other languages, but yeah, things don't move, uh, things don't change so fast in the hardware world as as they do in software. Mm. Okay. You already hinted at this a little bit, but what is your favorite part of the job and 
Then also, what is your least favorite part of your job? I hinted. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. Uh, already. What, what was my hint? That, uh, you like working, you know, at the at the stage of mass production, at least. Where you... Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what I like working in general. Yeah. Um, but at at work, uh, I don't. I, I like when I get into this like uh, deep focused states, or like when I'm in the flow, where I can mm -hmm. like have hours on the end just uh, developing something. That, and and usually to to get there, you have to be challenged right amounts so, because if something is really hard then you're going to lose interest or if something is really easy then you're going to feel like this should be automated or i'm kind of wasting my time yeah so so it, it doesn't happen that often but yeah and it, either hardware or software i really it's like choosing between two kids you know, favorite favorite child or something like that so i can't yeah i can't lean on one side hmm. okay now what is one misconception about your job or your industry that oh, I think many people have? That's actually a very good question because there is a pretty big, big misconception because I, I do introduce myself as like electronics engineer but as soon as like you throw in word hardware anywhere in the conversation people never picture me writing code and I write code 95% of my work like even if I'm responsible for developing hardware that part doesn't last that long the longer part is uh, writing software for that hardware. Mm -hmm because most of my friends are software developers usually yeah because of that assumption they they like think that i i'm not familiar with most of the concepts they're talking about but at the end of the day we're <laughs> i am going through all of that just on a different language yeah mm. well what is the difference as far as you can tell between like software engineering and then hardware programming yeah, i mean with the hardware programming it really helps you uh, to understand what's going on the hardware level and I actually had a really good example uh, recently where that if you didn't have hardware uh, knowledge, you wouldn't be able to solve the problem. And because we are using wireless communication to send data um, or to communicate with the device, some some part of the the circuit was malfunction malfunctioning randomly, kind of. And those are the worst bugs where if you could. If something is failing 100% of the time, that means like you can kind of follow the steps and catch what's wrong pretty fast. But if some part is failing sometimes, then then becomes this like cosmic rays problem or whatever, where you're like, oh, I don't know. It seems like on Tuesdays it's not working or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to catch it. And it, it turned out to be that um, some part of the... I mean, at first it seemed like it was a software problem because I changed some software and that stopped working. But what I changed was like a timing of some events. What that caused was to use wireless communication at the same time some sensors are running. And what that means is that the battery was drained more than, at, at that instance, more than usually. And because the battery was drained more, the voltages on the circuit were lower than they needed to be, which caused some, something to not work properly. Mm. And I don't know how clear was uh, the explanation. But... Yes, yeah, so I guess the like bigger challenge is that it's not maybe not so easy to do troubleshooting sometimes. Yeah, so I mean, what I wanted to say with this problem was that mm. if you were completely not, not aware of hardware and you were only focusing on software, you never, never catch the bug because there was no bug mm. in in the code itself. The, the bug was that you have to know battery specs and and how it works when certain parts of the circuit are turned on or off. Mm. Um, yeah, so that where, when if you were developing like a phone app or something like that, you definitely don't think of like a smartphone battery level. I mean, maybe it's just if, if it's like good or not, like high or low, you don't think like, should I turn on the camera at the same time uh, I'm playing a sound or something like that. Mm. What advice would you give someone who wants to work in your industry? <laughs> I mean, I don't know what is my, yeah. Yeah, like your okay, your industry being like I guess, embedded systems, hardware programming, or hardware design. Yeah, I, I mean, of course I'm biased, but I guess this is all about my opinion. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, I do think uh, experience that I had in toy industry really helped because of the going through a lot of products pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. And having that experience of different stages pretty rapidly, there are downsides of it. As I mentioned, the complexity is not there. And at some point, I mean, I started missing that. But I, I saw how, it, from engineering point of view, how is it to like prototype and mass produce and troubleshoot after mass production and whatever. But also from like the soft skills, I learned how to just talk with people who are not from my field. And 
and how to yeah get everybody work working together. I mean, one pretty interesting thing that I, when I was studying that I never thought I would have to worry about is like what kind of personality a robot should have. And a designer will come and and say like, oh, when the robot does this, it should be happy right here. And I'm like, what's it? what is happy like <laughs> what is the equation for you know like how do you make a machine look happy and then that that was a great experience because yeah being aware that uh, other people don't understand the concepts that you learn in your field because there is no way they will get in contact with that mm. um and how to translate ca- kind of how to bridge their their discipline to to engineering i think that's that's a very important part mm. okay and one thing that i'm kind of now curious about because yeah how you talk about tinkering with electronics and learning about that makes me want to like try that out <laughs> so uh, what kind of yeah how can you get started do you have any resources that you maybe can recommend or anything you can like google <laughs> to get started with um yes, just like learning by yourself about electronics i mean if uh, so there are pretty famous companies for i mean a few big companies or not in size but famous companies for for this uh, i mean the first one that kind of broke this barrier for getting electronics closer to beginners was uh, Arduino, which was, is an Italian company. Damn, I, I, those I imagine you can get like everywhere. Um, yeah, it's and, also not that expensive, right? So. Yeah, I mean, we are talking about <clears throat> 10 to 20 euros. Yeah. And I would recommend maybe buying a kit where you get not just the Arduino board itself, but... Uh, some sensors and stuff like that because because where, where embedded systems get fun is like if you have some inputs and then based on that you have some up, output so like i don't know measuring temperature in your room and displaying like temperature on the display uh i mean pretty nice intro project yeah and then if you're in the united states there is um, uh, adafruit company mm-hmm. they have even more up op- they were kind of like uh, how do you call it not predecessor but uh, the one that comes after uh, uh. <laughs> they kind of took a baton from uh, yeah. uh, f- from Arduino and uh, kind of expand on this uh, topic further. And the nice part of all of this is they're all open source. So if you feel like, okay, this is maybe too simple for you, the, the intro projects, you can see how do they make their own tools. Because, mm. um, yeah, everything is on there. Uh, with Adafruit, it's, it's actually really crazy how open source they are. They're, they're like streaming their development and they are putting like meeting notes online and you can pretty much feel like you are in their company and maybe uh in terms of community there is a hackaday.com <laughs> hackaday community where it's that that's actually mixed of like mechanical uh, electrical software uh where it's just a lot of uh uh yeah hobbies like doing whatever crazy stuff um and writing like articles about it and posting videos and i think yeah starting from that website you don't you don't need any more uh um, the references so that you will figure out the rest. And maybe before I forget, the reason why the freelancing part that I started was also partially so I can have like a making a company so I can have playground for for myself where I can continue tinkering and working on some projects that are interesting to me. And among other stuff, I'm also working on some platforms that will be for beginners to to play with and get into electronics. Yeah, hopefully uh, those will be ready in the time where <laughs> we can, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now I'll definitely link all of that down, down below in the description. Yeah, cool. Um, and what are some other industries where you could work as an embedded systems engineer? Like, I mean, mm-hmm. obviously not working in one industry because you're working, you've worked with toys, you're working with the water leak detection. <laughs> what are some Yeah, other I guess they're very different ones, but... Especially like as the time goes by, like er- everything has some kind of everything is connected to the internet. Everything has some electronics. So literally everything that you see around yourself that it has some kind of chip inside that does something. So it's quite limitless. Um, I'm thinking maybe there are some not so obvious around yourself, but any vehicle, any any tool in factory, like literally everything has. Somebody had to design those electronics. Mm. The camera recording this. Yeah, I mean on the on the more complex side for sure. Yeah. Microphone. This one has stuff inside. Yeah, and um, talking a little bit about like your personal life. How do you think uh, becoming an engineer? I think <laughs> I got very nervous. <laughs> yeah, not too personal. Just like 
do you think that being an engineer, becoming an engineer has impacted or maybe taken over part of your life or shaped you in some way? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say because the line between me being an engineer and anything else, if I, if I get to the time to be anything else, is very blurry. It is my passion and I, I, I kind of never lose energy working on it. So it takes most of my free time. Mm -hmm. um, which, by the way, actually, maybe this is, if we can take a, a few minutes just to talk about people that spend their free time on, on their career and not, I, I think here you there can be a misconception. I, I don't think to be successful engineer in our case, to be great at your job, I don't think you have to consume that 24-7. It just, for me, it just happens to be there because I just enjoy it. But I know so many great colleagues that, like, once they go home, they don't think about it until they come to their job ne next day. And, yeah, it's just, like, what, whatever suits you. Because I'm afraid that some some people get too intimidated, like, when they see, like, oh, uh, my colleague is also at night there working on uh, open source and they're contributing on GitHub, like, every night. And I'm mm. like, why? I mean, like, wait room or I'm running with my run club or something and yeah it's not it's not necessarily indicator of uh, you know how how valuable your skills are or how not, how not just how valuable your skills are but how far you can build them but so that, that was a small segue <laughs> um but yeah so for my my personal life i mean it, it helps in the sense that i have like a tangible skills i guess to offer uh and this anxiety over not having work or I don't know, not being able to support myself or anything like that, that, that completely disappeared after I started working, which was occupying a lot of my mind uh, before that. Uh, I don't know if that's a, the answer you were expecting or not, but that, that's definitely the biggest, uh, the biggest impact. And since you spend so much of your free time also doing kind of what you do for work, is there anything that you've found to you know, help you still keep a balance or still, you know, make sure that you rest enough or to do something that kind of balances out for working so much. Yeah, I mean, I, I do a lot of sports. Um, like I said, I I, uh, I grew up uh, where sports were much more valued than actually my academic performance mm -hmm. um, for better or worse. And that it, that is, I, I was doing professionally or semi-professionally until maybe like six years ago. Or until I started working pretty much. Mm. Uh, so it is a pretty big part of my life. I, I try to spend a lot of time like, working out. And that brings... Uh, w what I like about it is I usually meet people that are not from my field. And I think that's also very important to kind of <laughs> get out of my bubble a little bit um, and just be aware of what's going on outside. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And where do you see yourself or your career going forward? Is there something that you envision maybe in five years where you're going to be? Yeah, I, that's a good question. Where I, I think how I see my role right now, uh, usually in different uh, settings that I found myself, that there's still like a lot of a lot of companies are uh, creating the same mistakes uh, or are going through the same problems. And, and there's not much like learning from one company to another. I, I think software world is doing much better um, much better job at this at like setting best best uh, practices and and just the ways of working and then when i say software world i do mean like uh, higher level languages and again like app developing is a very good example and there is that gap that between hardware and software and i i am trying to figure out how to bridge that or like kind of I, I i don't like that there there's a lot of uh, problems are being solved more than once yeah and there is no reason for that Again, I'm trying to navigate like my way throughout my experience to be able to offer. Maybe that's even in like a shape of a book or something. Mm -hmm. There is like a guide of how you do these things that everybody faces the same problems, and you should not be reinventing the wheel, which happens a lot in my industry mm -hmm. because of the intellectual property or just because of not awareness. Uh, a little bit because, like I mentioned, not a lot of uh, young people are getting into this field. Um, so, and the the beginners are usually more aware of like the fresh tools that are out there. So it's a combination of a lot of stuff. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it's not like a position. Yeah, I'm. I want to be such and such. Uh, I want to contribute to solving this, or like at least minimizing the impact. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really cool goal. Yeah, we'll see how how it works. <laughs> Hopefully, that I mentioned my what I do in my with my freelance company that might turn into something that is not freelancing, but hopefully uh, offering some product or solution. Yeah, hopefully that's going on that trajectory. Mm, okay. Then I'd like to end with some rapid fire questions. No. You can try to make it rapid, buddy. A second half of nervous in this community. <laughs> there is uh, no need to be. Um, first question, what was the best and worst class or project that you had in university? Uh, uh, well, this is... Uh, I guess, I don't know if in your, uh, European universities or undergrads are like this, but in uh, U- US you have a lot of um, outside your field courses. So I would take like English courses, with history and stuff like that. They're mandatory. Mm. Like, and, and I'm pursuing computer engineering degree, paying a lot for it. Yeah. Um, so anything that was like outside what I signed up for. <laughs> I mean, I, I knew I was signing up for these classes, but anything that was yeah, outside my strict focus, uh, mm. I was. I thought it was like unnecessary. Ironically, I. I mean, I do think that knowledge is necessary, but not like uh, not being enforced like that. Yeah. Okay. Then, what is your favorite book? Mm, last year, I read uh, *Sapiens*. I don't know if you. I heard of it. I haven't yeah, read it. That uh, until *Sapiens*, I had like a, I don't know a list of top five, ten, whatever. I would recommend different books to different people, and after I read that that one book, it's like. I recommend that book to everybody. Like, forget what you're reading now. Read this. Okay. It, it's totally worth it. Okay. Uh, I have to mention, if if you are not into reading, maybe not the best book to start getting into reading. It's not the easiest book, but at, at least sometimes in your lifetime, you have to read it. Okay. You have to. I will drop everything and read it. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite blog or podcast, if you have anything? Um. The, uh, the time ago, this question is pretty crazy, actually, because it's my favorite blog. That you should drop everything. And <laughs> <laughs> First, you should read Sapiens, and then you... Okay. Um, it, it's called Wait by Wait But Why, dot com. Mm-hmm. And it's written by Tim Urban, and, um, and he just does, like, these deep dives into different kind of topics, mostly futuristic topics, um, but not, not, like, sci-fi, but the current technology and where it's going. But he when he does deep dive deep dive i literally mean he like starts with explaining like the big bang to arrive to like ai pretty much um and the, why i say the timing is crazy is because uh he just published his book and it's, it's his first book because he was writing so he's a blogger writer but this one blog post turned into such a long post that he turned into a book <laughs> um i didn't read the book because i didn't get it yet but but the the blog itself is for sure, a must. Okay, I will also drop everything for that. <laughs> a lot of dropping yeah. is going to happen. <laughs> okay, final rapid fire question. If you had to totally abandon your current engineering career and do a completely different career, what would you do? Uh, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't do anything. <laughs> uh, it's hard because um, I really like what I do. So I don't know if I, I mean, if I would have to abandon like my uh just my field then i would just do some other kind of engineering but if i have to like step out of stem fields um maybe something art so i can still cheat and make something we call it art Uh, okay a great uh great solution (laughs) great cheat uh yeah so it's been a pleasure it was so great having you on yeah thank you thanks for inviting me yeah for sure i was really excited when you said yes yeah i was very excited when you asked me um, and so for anyone wanting to like, yeah, find you online or connect with you after this, where should they go? Yeah. I mean, so I guess if they're listening or watching this, they will see my full first and last name, which yeah. so far, last time I checked, I was still the only person in the world with that name, at least when you Google it. Uh, so literally like wherever, um, you find me on, uh, yeah, LinkedIn or I don't even know what else it pops up like Facebook. Yeah. Feel free to reach out. Also, yeah, the company that I'm, uh, or like the freelance company that I'm building, uh, it's called uh, Lilordag, which is like uh, play on words, but um, in Swedish it means Little Saturday, and it actually has meaning. It's like, uh, it means Wednesday, and it's like to go out on Wednesdays. Uh. Uh, but also, if you directly translate it, and you take it literally from Serbian, then it's the name of my hometown. That, yeah, th- there I'm going to focus on... Uh, yeah, what I'm what I'm uh, working on in my spare time. So you have Instagram, right? Yeah, I'll try to share more as much as I can yeah. from my work. 
Okay, yeah, we'll link all of your socials yeah. down below. Thanks. And yeah, thank you so much for being here. And nothing is recorded. That was so good. I really enjoyed that conversation with Boris. My favorite part was probably where he shared about how you can get started working with electronics basically right now. It makes me want to go out and buy an electronics kit right away. So I might just do that. So thank you again, Boris Nemtovich, for coming onto the show and sharing your story. You can find the show notes for this episode on freshengineer.io slash podcast slash two, including links to everything we talked about today. Next week, I will talk to an energy engineer about choosing the right major, what nuclear engineering is, and what the work of an energy trader looks like. Subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts so you don't miss it. And here's already a little sneak peek. Don't be afraid to quit if mm. there's some subject that you don't like. Like you, maybe you have a really beautiful image in the beginning. Like, oh my God, I'm going to be a super like technical guy or I'm going to be super good at programming. And then once you actually touch it and you don't, you feel like, oh, it's not what you imagined, then it's also fine to quit it. And usually in the university, you have some chances to participate in other courses from different departments. And I also did that when I was studying. Like I just choose a course and, and to see if I actually interested in it or not. And you can try it out. And if you don't like it, just quit the subject. Thanks for tuning into the Fresh Engineer podcast, where fresh engineers share their stories.